So, how have the words of other people impacted your life? Either things that were spoken to you directly or things that were said about you. James actually devotes 12 verses in chapter 3 to this whole matter of the tongue. I'm going to go on and read the first eight verses of James 3. And as I read, maybe just think for a moment about how the words of others have impacted you as I read these eight verses in James chapter 3, 1 through 8. He says, not many of you should presume to be teachers, my brothers, because you know that we who teach will be judged more strictly. We all stumble in many ways. If anyone is never at fault in what he says, he is a perfect man able to keep his whole body in check. When we put bits into the mouths of horses to make them obey us, we can turn the whole animal. Or take ships as an example. Although they are so large and are driven by strong winds, they are steered by a very small rudder wherever the pilot wants to go. Likewise, the tongue is a small part of the body, but it makes great boasts. Consider what a great forest is set on fire by a small spark. The tongue is also a fire, a world of evil among the parts of the body. It corrupts the whole person, sets the whole course of his life on fire, and is itself set on fire by hell. All kinds of animals, birds, reptiles, and creatures of the sea are being tamed and have been tamed by man. But no one, no man can tame the tongue. It is a restless evil full of deadly poison. So I'm wondering this morning, have you ever ingested poison? You know, I know I've, I've had friends who their kids have gotten into various kinds of poison. You've got to react accordingly. And one of the things that stands out to me growing up in the 70s, we had one of those gold rotary phones mounted in the kitchen. Did you all have a gold rotary phone mounted in your kitchen? I think it was standard operating procedure if you grew up in the 70s. And somewhere near that phone, either posted by the phone or posted on the phone itself, was the number for poison control. Do you all remember that? The number for poison control. So I got to thinking, what do we do now? We don't have rotary phones mounted in the kitchen anymore, so what do we do about poison control? So I did a little research this week. I Googled it. There is poison.org now. So you can go to poison.org. Now, there's still an 800 number. It's not posted on the kitchen wall, but there's still an 800 number you can call, but you go to poison.org first. Of course, we had no concept of that in 1972. But here's the truth. Every single person in this room has ingested poison at some point. All of us, every single one of us, there are no exceptions. And I'm assuming that's occurred on many times for the vast majority of us. And you may be able to recall some of those instances or perhaps your mind has blocked it out. Blocked out those moments when you were on the receiving end of someone else's poisonous tongue, a restless evil, if you will. So I got to thinking this week, when have I been on the receiving end? And my mind went back to the sixth grade. Now, back in our day, you weren't on the the junior high or middle school campus in the sixth grade. We were still on an elementary school campus, but I think by the sixth grade, 
we were more in that middle school mindset. And so being in the middle school mindset, social things were changing among our friends. Friendships were changing. We're kind of at a strange time in terms of our formative years entering adolescence. And it was a tad bit confusing. And I remember on one particular day, they were having a teacher work day, and we were out of school. Now, you know, back in the dark ages when I went to school, those teacher work days were rare. And so somebody got up in front of the class the day before the teacher work day and said, hey, we're going to have this big party, this big gathering at somebody's house tomorrow afternoon at this time. Everybody's welcome. So my friend Gary and I, we rode our bikes over, and, and as we were riding up to this person's house, maybe 25 yards or so from from the house who were a couple of other friends, friends, who met us and said, y'all aren't welcome. This, this is, and I don't remember what the language was in the sixth grade, but it's something to the effect, this is our own elite social group and y'all aren't welcome. I think Gary and I thought at the time we had been singled out, but as I look back on it, I think there were a lot of students in our class that were not part of that elite social group. But it's amazing how events like that shape you and you carry those events with you even into adulthood. Poison does strange and unpredictable things. So I recall at the tender age of 12, I just sort of withdrew. I felt like I didn't fit. And socially, it was a challenging time, so I just kind of withdrew into my own cocoon, and that was a consequence of ingesting somebody else's poison. I remember being a senior in high school. I worked at Safeway, sacking groceries. Now, let me be quick to point out, we were not called sackers at Safeway. We were called courtesy clerks. I was a courtesy clerk at Safeway. And one of my really close friends worked with me at Safeway. We're sort of like partners in crime. You can have a lot of fun being a courtesy clerk. I could tell you some tales about the things that we did at Safeway. We referred to it as Slaveway. But uh, we had lots of fun. And on one particular evening shift, we got talking about our college plans for the next fall. And since my dad had passed away when I was 15 years old, I knew that I would get Small Social Security benefits. It was a, a death benefit that, you, that students get, and I would get that until I was 22 years old. And I mentioned to my friend Marty, as we made some financial plans for college, well, I'm going to continue to work, and Social Security benefits will help me pay for some of my tuition and expenses. And his response was, I have to work for my money. Felt really stinging at the time. He had no clue. He had no inkling what it was like to be 17 and to be fatherless. No clue at all. And so the damage or the consequence of ingesting poison was I became somewhat distrustful and wary of other people, including close friends. Now, here's the end of that story. 44 years later, Marty and I are still really good friends, and we still talk on a very regular basis. And then I think about people who have been close to me over the years and how they have been on the receiving end of somebody else's poisonous tongue. I worked for a dean at a university when I was teaching as an adjunct professor, just a delightful lady and a wonderful supervisor. And when she interviewed me for that adjunct teaching position, when we finished the interview, she kind of gave me this funny look and she said, well, you're, um, you're the minister of the Church of Christ here, aren't you? I said, yes, ma'am. I said, is, you know, is that going to be problematic with me teaching here in a state school? And she said, oh, not at all. She said, I grew up in the Church of Christ. I'm, I'm married in the Church of Christ. And uh, my, my husband and I were members of a church and she told me what city. I said, oh, really? And then she proceeded to tell me that her husband was unfaithful, that he left with another woman and just left her high and dry with these two small children. And as she went back to church, the people at that church basically conveyed to her, even verbalized to her, it's your fault. 
what have you done wrong? You know, you're flawed, on and on and on. And this is a lady who's really a super, super neat lady, not someone who's in this constant victim mentality. She's just a super neat lady. And she told me how that impacted her life at that time. And she and I ended up having a, a great working partnership and had really good spiritual consequences. But it means it stayed with me all this time. The potential we have, even in a church setting, to spread poison to someone else. And just the fact that we're in a church context doesn't mean that we are inoculated against somebody else's poisonous tongue. So I've been poisoned, and I suspect that you have as well, because the tongue is a restless evil full of deadly poison. So so what do you do with that? When people say things that are offensive to you, or they say things that are equally offensive about you, what do you do with that? And and the short story is we choose to forgive. Another topic for another day. But we choose to forgive with the awareness of another very important reality that I believe is even more painful. So here's what's more painful. Our tongues. My tongue. Let me speak in the first person. My tongue. My tongue continues to inject poison into the lives of other people. Let me just go on and confess it and admit it. My tongue on an ongoing basis continues to inject poison into the lives of other people. And I know there's instances where I'm fully aware of that. I know I did it, and I feel really bad, and I'm going to go back and try to maybe correct that. And there's probably even more instances when I was completely unaware. Which brings me to the second question of the day, and that is, how have your words impacted someone else's life? Not on the receiving end, but instead on the giving end. How have your words impacted someone else's life? Have your words injected poison or have your words been life-giving? The reason I state it that way is because, again, James refers to the tongue as being full of deadly poison. He's very specific in the language that he chooses. But isn't it true that the the tongue can be a source of life as well? Isn't that true? In the Old Testament and in Proverbs, lots of references to verbal communication in Proverbs. And one of those passages is in Proverbs chapter 10, verse 11, where it says, the mouth of the righteous is a fountain of life. The mouth of the righteous is a fountain of life, but the mouth of the wicked conceals violence. Now, as we, we turn it on ourselves, and we want to be honest, and we want to be accountable, and furthermore, we want to be very self-aware of our own shortcomings. So it occurs to me there are obvious forms of poison. We can be deceitful in our words, not quite telling the truth, just little pieces of the truth. Or we can convey a really hateful spirit. I think that's pretty obvious as well. And we can make the conscious choice to spread malicious gossip, and and that's really obvious. But I thought it might be helpful for us this morning to think in terms of the not-so-obvious forms of poison. And yet they are equally deadly. I think of words that are manipulative. You're manipulating another person. I use the term working someone. You're working them. And you have some end to which you want to work them. You're manipulating. You're playing them. 
and you have some selfish intent in mind as you choose to manipulate, that's as poisonous as it can be. I think of talking down to someone as if they are inferior. I remember being in the, the TSA line at Love Field on one occasion. I'm waiting my turn to go through the little thing where they x-ray you as you walk through. And there was a Hispanic gentleman who obviously didn't speak English. And he, he was an older gentleman. He was, he was obviously a senior citizen. And this TS, TSA agent was just being extremely rude and talking down to this man. And my blood pressure went from zero to 1,000 in about a millisecond. And I had two thoughts. I thought, well, I could intervene because I can speak enough Spanish where I could help this gentleman get through. Or the second option is I can go off on the TSA agent and end up in the federal penitentiary. <laughs> so I thought, what do I do? And by the time I, I got back down to my wits, he had gone through. But it occurred to me how vulnerable this gentleman is. He doesn't speak English. He's elderly. He's a little bit confused about the whole process. And this TSA agent was a little more impressed with his authority than he should have been and was talking down to him. That's a form of poison. I think of verbal abuse. Sometimes verbal abuse can be ever so subtle. It can even come across like we're being nice, but it's really not. It's verbal abuse couched in all sorts of odd forms. And I also think about that individual who has the ability in a group to stir the pot. And you wonder why people don't get along. You wonder why in a, in a team context there, there's conflict and things don't seem to be all right. And it's because someone in a very subtle manner is just quietly but consistently stirring the pot. And if that's not poison, I don't know what is. I think of using humor at someone else's expense when it's not funny. And I confess, and I think everything's funny. And I confess that I've used humor, I don't know how many times at someone else's expense, when it really was just not funny. Are you willing to do a thorough examination of your own verbal communication? Are you willing to examine your own heart? What is coming out of the overflow of the heart as you speak to other people? So I'm not about to ask you anything I'm not willing to do myself. So I did it ahead of time this week. I asked myself, okay, uh, what, what, what would a thorough examination of my own verbal communication look like? It wasn't much fun. I tell you what, I'm, I'm going to quit coming up with these kind of sermons. It wasn't fun at all. And one of the things that occurred to me immediately is when I'm communicating with people, I have a personality that is such that everything's fine until it's not. Y'all get that? Everything's fine until it's not. And so when things kind of go haywire, I go from zero to 100 way too fast. Just like my thoughts about the TSA agent, the things that I was thinking I was going to say to him were not pleasant. They would not have been said in a good tone of voice, and the content definitely would not have been positive. And so I'm guilty of everything's fine until it's not, and then things go south really, really fast. I, I continue to think about our youngest son. When I, I could get excited when I talked to him about things. We would have some come to Jesus meetings, and they weren't always real pleasant. And he would say, I hear you, Dad. I know what you're saying, but you can say it nice like Mom does. I heard that more than once from him. I think about the need to really think through what I'm going to say before I say it. Being quick-witted is a double-edged sword. Being quick-witted is you can respond quickly, and that's appropriate, and sometimes it's really helpful. And being quick-witted can also get you in a lot of trouble because you're really not thinking through what you're about to say and what the implications of that are. And then the last thing that occurred to me is, as I did my own self-examination, is I am opinionated to the point of being rude. Isn't that possible to be opinionated to the point of being rude? 
So are we just going to leave it there? Are we going to go about our week this week? Are we going to go to lunch today and just leave it there and say, okay, I guess that's true. The tongue is a restless evil full of deadly poison. Or perhaps we could think otherwise. I noted a moment ago, Proverbs 10, verse 11, the mouth of the righteous is a fountain of life. And in Proverbs chapter 15, verse 4 says, the soothing tongue is a tree of life. And then in Proverbs 18, 21, the tongue has the power of life and death. I want to encourage us this morning. Let's flush the poison from our system and make the conscious choice to express life-giving words. An encouraging word. An encouraging word that's well thought out and specific. And in the same way that you don't forget the poison that you've ingested, you also remember those encouraging words. 20 years ago, I had an elder tell me at a really difficult time in my life. He looked me in the eye and said, you are a brother in Christ and a member of our church family before you are an employee as a preacher. Do I make myself clear? And for a guy who was about 6'8 and weighed about 260, I said, yes, sir. It felt so encouraging and so life-giving at the time. 20 years later, it still feels encouraging and life-giving. We can encourage, we can have a tongue that gives life by conveying patience to other people. I mean, actually verbalizing that that you're patient with them, that you're going to walk alongside them. You're not giving up on them. Just convey patience to them. I was was reminded of the the Christian comedian Dennis Swanberg. And if you've never seen any of Swanberg's work, look at him on YouTube. He's hilarious. Swanberg talked about growing up and his mom would be upset with him about something. And he said, you know, his mom, you know, four or five days later after he'd done something, she'd look at him and she'd say, do you feel bad? Do you feel bad? And I got to thinking, we can kind of be that way. We, we're not really patient with people, and we, we want to make people feel bad for a long, long time. Can we express a word of hope to people? There's so much hopelessness in our world, and I feel that need, especially as someone who speaks on a Sunday morning. I had a conversation with a lady who's a single mom, again, had a couple little kids, sort of like the dean of the university I referenced a moment ago. And she said, probably would have been in the decade of the 80s, she drug her kids to church, she's a single mom, her husband had left her. And she said the preacher's sermons were good, he was well prepared, they were biblical, they probably had leanings towards being hellfire and brimstone. And even though they were biblically accurate, she said, I left every Sunday feeling hopeless. That that, that has convicted me. My conversation with her convicted me so much that one of the things I pray every single Sunday morning early is, may I convey hope today. And in my words, may I never leave people hopeless. It deeply affected me and touched my heart. What a grave responsibility. The importance of expressing value to people, that people have value. To convey to them, you are a priceless gift. You have value. You are important. And finally, I would say the importance of investing time in meaningful conversation. I want to just briefly tell you about an experience I had a week ago Saturday. I was invited to a 5K in Dallas. It was a walking 5K, so I could actually participate. I mean, it, was, it was tough in the heat. And the 5K, there was a gathering of people from all over the United States, and they had one thing in common. They had lost a loved one to suicide. 
and more specifically, all of these individuals, all these loved ones they lost, they were either police officers or firefighters. And so bluehelp.org organizes these annual gatherings, and there was one in Dallas that I went to and attended. They have speakers, and they have small groups, and they did the 5K, and I got to participate in some of it last Saturday. And I'm around people from all over the nation who have this in common. They've lost their loved one who was a first responder to suicide. So I was in line to get my pulled pork sandwich at the food truck after the 5K and kind of got, got pulled pork on the mind. And there was a lady and her two younger teenagers, I would say 12 to 13, 14 age range, a, a little girl, a, a daughter, and a son. And I thought, you know, I'm, I'm hot, I'm tired, I'm dehydrated, I'm up my pulled pork. And yet there's these people behind me, probably a good idea for me to invest in some meaningful conversation. So I forced myself to do it and got to talking to them. And it turns out this lady's from Minnesota. Her husband was a police officer who took his life, and she's got these two young kids. I had a meaningful conversation with her and also had a conversation with both the kids as well. And it was good, and we joked around, and we laughed. And I've never felt more humbled in all my life. How important it is to think about people and where they are and what they're experiencing. In some cases, you have no inkling what they're experiencing, but just to invest in meaningful, life-giving conversation. So I'm wondering today, what is a, what's an appropriate invitation? And I think the most appropriate invitation this morning should come directly from Scripture. Not from James 3, but instead from Ephesians 4, 29. Paul says, do not let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouths, but only what is helpful for building others up according to their needs, that it may be benefit those who listen as we stand and sing this morning.